Good morning and welcome to worship at St. Andrew Lutheran Church. Today we continue our Easter celebrations, giving thanks to God for the victory over our spiritual enemies of sin, death, and the power of the devil that our Savior Jesus has won for us by his resurrection from the dead. We give thanks to God for that fact, uh, which, as we talked about last week, gives us the, the sure and certain proof that our sins have been forgiven and that eternal life with God in heaven is ours. And so in, the, uh, in our sermon text this morning, we focus especially on the word of God to us through the Apostle John, in which God tells us how we can distinguish from the true faith and uh, many false claims about salvation and God and spirituality that exist in the world. And that is to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And everyone who has faith in Jesus as the Son of God and the Savior, we then also become sons and daughters of our Heavenly Father. So we give thanks to God for that, for his grace and the, the guidance of the Holy Spirit, which allows us to know this truth of our salvation. We praise our God this morning, beginning with our opening hymn, He's Risen, He's Risen, on page three in the service folder. May God bless our worship. stand. We continue at the bottom of page three in the service folder. Alleluia. Christ is risen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to grant us forgiveness. 
Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this, I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. us pray. O risen Lord, you came to your disciples and took away their fears with your word of peace. Come to us also by your word and sacrament, and banish our fears with the comforting assurance of your abiding presence. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. The first reading from God's Word for our meditation this morning is from the book of the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 26, 
verses 6 through 29. This is one of the instances in which the Apostle Paul was on trial for his faith and his uh, testimony of the name of Jesus. Uh, he was greatly opposed by the same religious leaders of the Jewish people who had opposed Jesus and uh, who just uh, some short years earlier had uh, brought Jesus to Pontius Pilate to be crucified. And they had plotted to kill Paul uh, in secret, even though they didn't have the legal authority to do so. Uh, but uh, those plans were thwarted, and Paul was instead arrested and left to languish in prison for a number of years. And when he had the opportunity to testify before the authorities, uh, he boldly proclaimed the truth of Jesus, the Savior of all, not just of the Jewish people, but of all people. We read now from Acts chapter 26. And now I stand on trial because of my hope in the promise made by God to our fathers, the promise that our 12 tribes hope to attain as they earnestly serve God night and day. I am being accused by the Jews concerning this hope, O king. Why does it seem unbelievable to any of you that God raises the dead? I too was convinced that it was necessary to do many things hostile to the name of Jesus the Nazarene. And that is what I did in Jerusalem. After receiving authority from the chief priests, I put many of the saints in prison. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. I often tried to make them blaspheme by punishing them throughout all the synagogues. Because I was so insanely angry with them, I even pursued them to foreign cities. That is how I came to be traveling to Damascus, with the authority and commission of the chief priests. At noon along the road, O king, I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shining around me and those traveling with me. We all fell to the ground, and I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew dialect, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. Then I said, Who are you, Lord? The Lord replied, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Now get up and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and witness to the things you have seen and to the things I will reveal to you. I will rescue you from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you. You are to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, so that they may receive the forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Therefore, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the vision from heaven. Rather, I first told those in Damascus and Jerusalem about it, and then throughout the entire country of Judea and also the Gentiles. I told them that they should repent and turn to God, while also doing works that are consistent with repentance. These are the reasons the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. But I have had help from God right up to this day, and so I stand testifying to both small and great, I'm saying nothing other than what the prophets and Moses said would happen, that the Christ would suffer, and as the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light to our people and to the Gentiles. While Paul was saying these things in his defense, Festus shouted, Paul, you are out of your mind. Your great learning is driving you insane. But Paul replied, I am not insane, most excellent Festus, but I am clearly speaking words that are true and sensible. Certainly, the king to whom I am freely speaking knows about these things. Indeed, I cannot believe that any of these things has escaped his notice, because this has not been done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you believe. Then Agrippa said to Paul, In such a short time, are you going to persuade me to become a Christian? Paul replied, I pray God that whether in a short time or a long time, not only you, but also all those who are listening to me today would become what I am, except for these chains. This is the word of the Lord. And we join now to sing the psalm of the day, Psalm 16, printed on page 8 in the service folder.
The second reading is from the New Testament book of 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 6 through 11. Here the Apostle Peter tells us about the implications of the resurrection of our Savior Jesus from the dead. Uh, that no matter what happens to us in this life, we can always turn to God in, in time of any trouble for confidence in his blessing and ultimately in the eternal glory of heaven that he has prepared for us because of the resurrection of Jesus our Savior. We read, Therefore humble yourselves under God's powerful hand, so that he may lift you up at the appointed time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Have sound judgment. Be alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him by being firm in the faith. You know that the same kinds of sufferings are being laid on your brotherhood all over the world. After you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who called you into his eternal glory in Christ Jesus, will himself restore, establish, strengthen, and support you. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. The verse of the day is from John chapter 20. Alleluia, alleluia. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Alleluia. Please stand for the reading of the Gospel. The Holy Gospel for this second Sunday of Easter is written in the Gospel according to St. John, chapter 20. Glory be to you, Lord. These events take place uh, on that first uh, Easter evening, and then also a week later, on the week after Easter, uh, one time at which Jesus appeared to his disciples when Thomas was not with them. And then a week later, uh, Thomas was with them and Jesus appeared to them again. On the evening of that first day of the week, the disciples were together behind locked doors because of their fear of the Jews. Jesus came, stood among them, and said to them, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. So the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. Just as the Father has sent me, I am also sending you. After saying this, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. Whenever you forgive people's sins, they are forgiven. Whenever you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. But Thomas, one of the twelve, the one called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples kept telling him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger into the mark of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will never believe. After eight days, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them. Peace be with you, he said. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and look at my hands. Take your hand and put it into my side. Do not continue to doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus, in the presence of his disciples, did many other miraculous signs that are not written in this book. But these are written, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. This is the Gospel of our Lord. Praise be to you, o Christ. We now join to confess the Christian faith using the words of the Nicene Creed, beginning at the bottom of page 10 in the service folder. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, 
begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated as we join to sing the hymn of the day, O Sons and Daughters of the King, printed on page 12 in the service folder.
The portion of God's word for our special meditation this morning is from the New Testament book of 1 John chapter 5, verses 1 through 6. You can find those verses in the Pew Bible. If you take the Bible, if you wish to follow along with printed form, you can take the Bible out of the pew rack in front of you and turn to page 1210, page 1210. Or you can simply listen as I read the verses now. The Apostle John writes, Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. This is how we know that we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out his commands. This is love for God, to obey his commands, and his commands are not burdensome, for everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. He did not come by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who testifies, because the Spirit is the truth. This is the word of the Lord. Grace and peace to you from God our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. This first letter of the Apostle John is rather polemical. Of course, there there are beautiful passages of gospel truth, the truth of God's love for us through Jesus our Savior. But John is also writing specifically to counter some rather dangerous, false teachings that had begun to, to gain popularity at that time. So he's, he's writing to warn the Christian, all the Christian churches of that time to beware of those false teachers who were a real and serious threat because they claimed to have a, a prophetic authority to, to have been received a, a message directly from God. They claimed to have, have been in a, a special communion with God so, so that they were, they said, an elite group of Christians to whom other people, other Christians should look, and to whom other Christians should ask for advice. Well, in our reading today, we see the Apostle John applies several tests to these, the teachings of, of these self-professed prophets, asking again and again, what kind of Christian life do they live? And how do they love their fellow human beings? And in what... And what truth is their faith grounded? In Jesus or in some aberrant teaching? In our sermon text from 1 John chapter 5, the Holy Spirit shares counsel through the Apostle John on three tests of the true faith, how we can determine what is the truth from God for us to believe. So first of all, we see in 1 John chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, John writes, Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. This is how we know that we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out his commands. So we see three very important actions or or attitudes in those verses. Believes, loves, and carries out his commands. And these tests do more than simply inform us of some historical problem in the Christian church 2,000 years ago. They point us also right to the problem in our own hearts and lives. And they cause us to cling ever more firmly to our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus. And so let's focus on each of these three tests that the Apostle John mentions in this reading. First of all, he mentions believing, and and that doesn't mean just to have any belief, just to, no matter whatever you believe in your heart, your truth, that truth is good enough for you. No, he says in verse 1, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Well, the Bible doesn't mention this name, but uh, in other ancient historical texts, we read about a man named Serinthus, who lived at the time of the Apostle John, who 
who simply couldn't wrap his mind around the biblical truth that Jesus was born of a virgin, of a woman who had never been married or who had never had a relationship with a man. He he thought it was impossible. And so he believed that Jesus was simply the natural-born son of Joseph and Mary. And so he taught that Jesus was, yes, a superior man. He showed evidence of that in his life, he, he said, that he was a a man who was specially endowed by God with a a tremendous amount of righteousness. He lived a very moral and upright life with with special knowledge and wisdom and power from God. But he himself was not actually the Son of God, was not true God, this man Serinthus said. And so he said that instead, at Jesus' baptism, the Christ, which was, he, he described as kind of a divine spark of, of power, descended upon Jesus in the form of a dove, and, and that is what enabled Jesus to reveal God to the people and to perform miracles. But then he said that before Jesus' suffering and death on the cross, that that divine spark, the Christ, left Jesus, and so that on the cross, only the human being, Jesus, suffered and died. Well, as we evaluate that idea, we can immediately see, especially if we recall the, the Bible passages that we read in our sermon text last Sunday on Easter Sunday from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we can immediately see what this kind of idea does to the heart and core of the Christian faith. If it was only a human being who suffered and died, then his death has no meaning whatsoever beyond himself. It has no ability to overcome sin and death for you and me. If that were true, then the Christian religion is is reduced simply to a nice set of of pious rules to follow, to follow in the example that Jesus set while he was living on the earth. But, But then the victory of the resurrection would only have been his alone. And as Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, if that were true, then we are the most pitiful of all people because that means we are still in our sins and destined for death and ultimately eternal death in hell. But lest we get the idea that Serenthus' heresy was settled once and for all by the Apostle John's letter and that this morning we're simply just having a nice history lesson that doesn't really apply all that much to us today, just think about in your own life how recently perhaps a neighbor or a friend, an acquaintance has said to you, someone who is not a Christian has said to you, well, we may have different beliefs, but after all, we're all just trying to get to the same place. We're all just trying our best to live a good life so that we can all end up in heaven. Or when was the last time that, uh, that you simply had to believe you felt in your heart that you just had to believe more strongly in God in order for God to really accept you, or you just had to to try a little bit harder in order to earn God's favor. Those opinions are, at the root, actually very similar. They're both saying, uh, indirectly, that yes, Jesus was just a a very good person, a, a good moral teacher and example, Yes, he was a specially blessed by God and whose life was, was an example that God put there for us to follow, but whose death and resurrection really don't actually have very much impact on us, except for just giving us uh, some direction to follow through, through our lives. But in fact, the exact opposite of this idea is true. Our salvation has indeed been won by the Lord Jesus Christ, God's Son, who lived and died and rose again all in our place as our substitute, our Savior. God calls us his children because Jesus died on the cross in order to win that privilege for us. And we come to Jesus not just for an example to follow in our lives, but for the very grounding, the foundation of our faith for the source of forgiveness and salvation whenever we doubt and wander away from him and his will into sinful thoughts or words or actions. 
Remember from the life of Jesus about the father who came to Jesus pleading for Jesus to heal his son? And Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he replied. And speaking of the demon that possessed him, it has often thrown him into fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, he said to Jesus, take pity on us and help us. And Jesus replied, if you can, everything is possible for him who believes. And then immediately that boy's father cried out, Lord, I believe, help me overcome my unbelief. The plea of that father is ours as well. On this second Sunday of Easter, we are reminded again that we can do nothing to earn our own salvation. That has all been accomplished for us by Jesus our Savior. Because he is God's all-glorious and all-powerful Son. The Savior that God had promised to send all the way back, almost at the beginning of time, to Adam and Eve after they first sinned. The one that he had promised would bring restoration to the world and restore a harmonious relationship between God and people. And as we have said, Jesus is Lord, we have the salvation that God has promised to his people. And so now as believers in Jesus, we daily seek the power of the Holy Spirit to know and and ever more firmly believe his salvation, even in the face of contradictory opinions that we hear in the world around us, even in the face of events in our own lives that lead us to wonder and doubt about whether God's love is real for us. So the first test of the true faith is, where do we go when we doubt? Do our questions lead us to wonder about our salvation? To doubt whether we really are saved? Because if we were, certainly God wouldn't allow these things to happen in our lives. Not at all. By the Holy Spirit's blessing, our questions simply become the way in which God brings us to a stronger faith in him as he answers those questions with the assurance of his love and salvation through his word. The Apostle John writes in verse 1 of our reading, Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. And so here we see John telling us the second test of resurrection faith is our love for each other. So we see an example of that in our gospel reading for today from John chapter 20. The Bible doesn't tell us where Thomas was on that Easter evening when Jesus appeared to the other ten disciples and others who were gathered together. When, when Jesus granted them that strange and wonderful gift of the Holy Spirit, when he called them back into his service after just a a couple of evenings earlier, they had all forsaken him and fled for fear of their lives when Jesus was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. We can imagine that there must have been a great deal of confusion in those days after Maundy Thursday and Good Friday, after Jesus had been arrested and and then crucified. And so when perhaps it was when the disciples scattered on Thursday evening, that Thomas had become separated from the others, and maybe he didn't know where they had met up together. Or perhaps he was simply out on on some errand when Jesus appeared to the other disciples on that first Easter evening. But wherever he was, when he did rejoin them, he came face to face with those brothers in Christ who had experienced something marvelous, something that, that Normally, they they wouldn't have been able to believe if they hadn't seen it with their own eyes, the appearance of the risen Lord Jesus himself. And Thomas, who hadn't been there to see it, found that he simply could not bring himself to believe something so unbelievable. But what happens next is something rather surprising. Thomas's doubt doesn't make him an outcast from the other disciples. Wouldn't it have been neat to to have been there in that room in order to to see that conversation that unfolded? 
Imagine the wonder that the other disciples expressed in their replies. Well, yeah, Thomas, we know it's hard to believe. We don't know how it's possible, but, but we saw him. We saw him. He was here with us. You have to believe us. But when Thomas didn't believe, after, even after the repeated testimonies and encouragements, well, they didn't cast him out and lock him outside the room they were in. No, he was there together with them a week later when again Jesus appeared to them and said, Peace be with you. We can imagine that during that intervening week, what must have seemed like an eternity of doubt to Thomas, his fellow disciples supported him and stayed with him. That's just what the widow or the parent of a, a sick child or the person who is, is feeling abandoned and alone needs from their fellow believers. At times when life seems to knock us down and, and, and rub our face in the mud, believers are left to question deeply all that they have known and believed about God up to that point. It's just at that time that the love and concern of fellow Christians can support them and help to lead them through those darkest days of their lives. The Apostle John says in our reading that that's exactly what happens when Christ lives in and with his people and when they have firm faith in him. Then we are enabled to love those who have doubts or or those who sin against us because we know that Jesus has forgiven them just as he has forgiven us. And his love heals that breach. In verse 3 of our reading, we come to the third test of the true faith. And the Apostle John says that that is found in obeying God's commandments. He says, this is love for God, to obey his commands. And his commands are not burdensome. Now, by ourselves, of course, we could never fulfill all of God's commands. 100% perfection, 100% of the time as God's law requires. And in fact, we often resent, if not openly, at least sometimes in our hearts, having to live by these rules when we see so many people in the world around us who don't live by those rules and seem to be doing just fine in their lives, even without obeying. We have the power of the risen Savior Jesus within us by his Holy Spirit so that we naturally and joyfully obey God's commands as a result of his love for us, motivated by his amazing grace to us. And so we, we catch ourselves actually forgiving where maybe we have been tempted not to before or going out of our way to help someone maybe we would never have helped before. Then we have further evidence that the resurrection faith is ours because Jesus himself is working his new life within us. Following the commands of God is not burdensome, John tells us. The new life that we have through our risen Savior Jesus fills us so that we as a renewed part of God's creation work and live and love in this world in the way that God intended. And that sense of things working in the way God intended makes our fulfilling of his will simply an easy yoke to carry, a, a light burden as we follow our Savior Jesus, motivated by his amazing grace for us. And so our faith in the risen Jesus is truly a new birth a new spiritual life within us when it is built on that foundation of Jesus, the Savior. It moves us to love others and to obey God's commands. What a joy it is that our risen Savior Jesus lives in us and empowers us. Let's go and live in his love. Amen. And we join now in singing our next hymn, We Walk by Faith and Not by Sight, on page 13 in the service folder.
we now give offerings from thankful hearts to our Savior God. Please stand for prayer. We follow the responsive prayer of the church beginning on page 14 in the service folder. O Lord God, our strength, our song, and our salvation, you fulfilled your promises by the resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, from the dead. In your compassion, you sent Christ, the Good Shepherd, who laid down his life to rescue the lost. Lift our eyes heavenward to see him who lives to make intercession for the saints and grant us confidence in the greatness of his power. Keep before us the vision of your redeemed people standing before your throne and singing the song of victory. Make us instruments of your peace as we bring the good news of hope and new life to those around us. Guide us in the use of all that you have entrusted to us, our time, our talents, and our treasures. Merciful Lord Jesus, grant healing to the sick and strengthen the faith of the suffering and the dying. Assure them of your abiding presence and comfort them with the hope of eternal life. And dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for watching over our brother and sister in Christ, Jason and Meishu, during the recent earthquake in Taiwan. We pray that you would uh, bless them and help them to be able to repair uh, damage that their, prop- that their home sustained in the earthquake. Uh, but we thank you that uh, you spared the, the region that they live in from, from serious damage. We ask for your blessing on all those who are grieving the loss of loved ones uh, during the Uh, destruction from the earthquake, and those who have sustained injury and and serious uh, damage to property and livelihood. We pray that you would bless them and and give healing and recovery and comfort to those who are mourning. And especially we pray that you would use this tragedy uh, to bring many to believe in you as their Savior, giving them the, the true comfort that comes from knowing your son Jesus as their Savior. We ask that you would watch over Darlene the stepdaughter of our sister in Christ, Rose, as Darlene uh, still has lost most of her sight following uh, follow-up surgery to remove the remainders of the tumor that had been in her brain. Uh, We thank you that that surgery was successful in removing the tumor. We pray, if it is your will, that you would now grant Darlene restoration of her sight. We pray above all that no matter what happens, that you would be with her and bless her and Uh, Give her firm confidence and faith in your love and faithfulness to her through Jesus, her Savior. No matter what happens in in the coming days and weeks and months, uh, as far as her eyesight is concerned, help her look forward at at the very least, ultimately, to the time when through faith in Jesus, you will bring her to your side and, and restore her to perfect sight and perfect health to live with you forever. 
we ask for your continued blessing also on our sister in Christ, Stacy, as she continues uh, to undergo one more day of, of radiation and chemotherapy and then prepares to undergo uh, surgery and followed by multiple surgeries after that. We pray that you would give her the strength that she needs both physically and also emotionally and spiritually um, to, to continue down this long road that lies before her. We ask for your blessing upon the doctors as they plan and, and prepare and ultimately carry out these surgeries. We pray according to your will that you would grant it success and that you would grant her a full healing and a restoration of, of her, her physical condition to full health. And we ask that you would hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. Gracious Father, you have restored to us the joy of your salvation. With happy hearts, we come before you and say, Alleluia. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We now continue with the sacrament portion of the service. As noted in the service folder, following the teachings of the Bible, we practice close communion. And so we ask that only those who are current communicant members of this congregation or of one of our sister churches in the Wells or the ELS would come forward to receive the Lord's Supper this morning. For any visitor who is not a communicant member of one of our sister churches, we ask that you would simply observe the Lord's Supper this morning, but I'd be very happy to speak with you about possibly becoming a member of our church and receiving the Lord's Supper with us in the future. And we now continue with the spoken responses at the bottom of page 15 in the service folder. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. And we praise you especially for the glorious resurrection of your Son, the true Passover Lamb, who by his sacrifice took away the sins of the world and by his resurrection restored everlasting life. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
Please stand. We join together in the Song of Simeon on page 18 in the service folder. give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Almighty God, by the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, you conquered death and opened the gate to eternal life. Grant that we who have been raised with him through baptism may walk in the newness of life and ever rejoice in the hope of sharing his glory. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be dominion and praise, now and forever. Amen. Now may the God of peace, who brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, in connection with his blood, which established the eternal testament, may he equip you with every good thing to do his will, as he works in us what is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ. To him be glory forever and ever. be seated as we join to sing our closing hymn, I Know of a Sleep in Jesus' Name, on page 19 in the service folder. Christ is risen. Hallelujah.
a joy to hear God's word and praise and pray to him together with you this morning. Warm welcome to our visitors who are with us this morning. Uh, feel free to everyone to stick around and introduce yourself to anybody you don't know yet. Uh, everyone's welcome to enjoy a time of fellowship together and then all are invited to stay for our adult Bible study as we continue our uh, series that we've been slowly working our way through, uh, 10 Lies About God, uh, so similar to what we brought up in our sermon this morning. Sometimes some of the, the, the voices, the opinions that we hear about God and spirituality, even about the Bible and Christianity, may sound reasonable, but when we compare them to God's word in the Bible, we find out that they are not all entirely true. So that's what we're going through in this Bible study. You're invited to join us. Even if you haven't been with us before, you'll be able to jump in uh, very easily. And our children are uh, welcome to stay for Sunday school following the service as well. Um, let's see, just a couple of things to highlight from the announcements in the, the back of the service folder. Uh, one is that uh, former St. Andrew pastor Doug Semensky, who is a member of our sister church, Good Shepherd in Downers Grove, uh, extends a warm invitation to all of us, uh, whoever would like to come, friends and, and uh, as well are welcome to this coming Saturday. Good Shepherd is hosting a speaker uh, presenting on the topic of Abraham Lincoln's use of the Psalms. So that's this coming Saturday at 2 o'clock p.m. at Good Shepherd in Downers Grove. The address is there in the service folder. And if you plan to attend, uh, they just request that you respond to the link that uh, is provided in the service folder there, or you can go to the Good Shepherd uh, Church website as well. Or if you'd like to contact Pastor Semensky, I'm sure he'd love to hear from you. And uh, we've had some, some scam calls for numbers that we've printed in the service folder before, so I didn't put his number in the service folder uh, so that he doesn't get any scam messages. Um, but if you'd like his phone number, just ask me and I'll give it to you. And aside from that, um, God bless you the rest of this day and this coming week. Mm -hmm.